Hello everybody, uh, let's start from here again. So, uh, the most important structure of the eyeball is the retina, as I mentioned already. And in this picture, you can see this yellow structure is the retina and it is located only in the posterior part of the eyeball. It is the innermost layer. And if you see the structure of the retina, uh, in the retina you will see a slightly depressed area that is called the fovea centralis. And around the fovea centralis, you will see a circular structure or area that is called the macula lutea. Okay, so macula lutea is this area and in the center of the macula lutea is this depressed area that is called the fovea centralis. Okay, so the retina is thin in this fovea centralis part, which is a very small, tiny area in the center of the macula lutea. Macula lutea is a kind of circular 5.5 millimeter diameter area, okay, uh, near the center of the retina, okay. And there is another structure or area you will see uh, in the retina. Through that area, the optic nerve uh, emerges or you know gets out exists and also the retinal blood vessels enter so you can see that this area here where there is no photoreceptors or rods or cones so that's why this area is also called the blind spot because in this area there is no photoreceptors and through this area, the optic nerve gets out and the retinal blood vessels pass, okay? And this uh, optic disc is also known as the blind spot, okay? And the optic disc is located more medially to the macula lutea or fovea centralis okay and the uh, macula lutea is located uh, about four to five millimeter temporal that means lateral and 0 0.8 to 0 0.8 millimeter inferior so actually the macula lutea is located more temporal means laterally how much laterally i said that four to five millimeter lateral to the optic disc and also inferior that means below the optic disc 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 millimeter below okay now um, the fovea centralis is the point where the cones are present in highest density. Huge number of cones are present in that tiny area in the center of the macula lutea. And in general, uh, the number of cones is much higher in the macula lutea uh, compared to the rest of the retina. Okay, so now if I draw here, okay, so this is the eyeball, and I'm only drawing the retina here. So this is the retina, and this part the retina is thin 
because there is a depression in fovea centralis so this is the retina okay and here uh, you see the depressed area that is the fovea centralis okay now uh, the retina has two layers in it the outer layer of the retina is called the pigmented layer so i am drawing with the green this is the pigmented layer okay pigmented because the pigments granules melanin are present in this layer okay and this pigmented layer is very important because the light that enters into the eye <coughs> this is the cornea right and you know that um, light passes this is the ciliary body right is the lens you already know so the light enters and goes all the way to the back right and passes through the retina and first the light is captured by the pigmented layer why because in the pigmented layer you have the light absorbing chemicals okay that pigment uh, absorbs the light so prevents the scattering of the light or prevents the reflection of the light so first the light passes through the retina so goes like uh, to the outer layer first and um, uh, is absorbed by the pigmented layer that uh, you know um, uh, absorbs the light and prevents the scattering or reflection of the light and this pigmented layer uh, has other important functions you already know that the middle layer is the vascular layer right remember that the middle vascular layer let me draw here so this is the choroid which has plenty of blood right blood vessels so what happens you see uh, the pigmented layer gets nutrition and oxygen as well as other vascular you know uh, chemicals those are important to keep the retina healthy so what happens that from the vascular layer choroid the pigmented layer since it is just you know under the choroid it absorbs the oxygen and nutrition and other chemicals and deliver them to the inner layer of the retina which is called the neural layer so this is the inner layer of the retina this is the neural layer where you have photoreceptors and other important cells okay so this is the inner layer of the retina the neural layer also called sensory neural and the green pigmented so those are the two layers okay so the pigmented layer prevents the scattering of the light by absorbing the light and also provides nutrition to the retina inner layer of the retina and also it is 
a protecting layer so it protects the inner layer of the retina now if we just see uh, the retina this part the fundus if we take the picture of the fundus of the retina and see uh, like this so this is the picture uh, of the retina and uh, this is the macula lutea right and this is medial so optic disc this is the optic disc or blind spot and this is the fovea centralis and as i mentioned that uh, this is macula lutea this is fovea centralis and if you see the distribution of rods and cones these are two photoreceptors right the rods are present mostly in the outer part of the retina that means located in the peripheral part of the retina so these are the rods and the number of rods is much more than the number of cones and the cones are located in the center of the retina and i mentioned in the fovea centralis the highest number of cones are located heavily present in the fovea centralis okay uh, also the cones are located in the macula lutea and there are three types of uh, color sensitive cones in the retina the red color green color and blue color okay so that's why we say red green and blue cones so the blue red and green those are three types of color sensitive cones that is they you know uh, are activated by three different wavelengths of the electromagnetic energy three types of color sensitive cones in human eye some creatures have less some creatures have more than three okay uh, that's why human eye is trichromatic some monkeys have two bichromatic um, so they see less color okay so now if uh, you see the number of rods in human eyes there are about 120 million of rods okay however the number of cones um, is uh, between six to seven millions okay much less now uh, as i mentioned that uh, if you see the back part of the eye <coughs> again uh, this is the retina i am drawing and this is the fovea right depression and the optic disc is here okay so um, in this part the retina is thin because of that depression right in the fovea so when the light enters you see here uh, to go to the pigmented layer the outer layer of the retina 
uh, in this area the light has to pass thick retina which is about half, half millimeter thick so not too thick but thicker than this part right here it is thin uh, where the fovea is so the light can easily pass through quickly pass through this fovea and activate the photoreceptors here okay and as i mentioned the photoreceptors cones are heavily present in this part here cones so the light will hit the cones quickly easily because of the thinness of the retina in this area make sense so some layers of the retina are pushed to the side to make this area thin okay so the cones will be quickly and easily be activated okay now the cones give the photopic vision that means the daylight or bright light vision okay so cones give the photopic vision and the cones are activated by bright light okay so to see uh, the things in bright light you need the cones cones are also responsible for the visual acuity that means to see the things small very small things clearly that's the visual acuity where uh, to see the edges or you know the things in smallest and clear that is the acuity that is given by the cones and also color vision to see the colors okay so these three are the most important functions of the cones now since the fovea centrale is, is located near the center of the retina inside the macula lutea this is the macula lutea so uh, to to put the light from an object you have to look straight so the light will straight you know be focused on the fovea centralis okay um, if you don't look straight like the object is here but you are looking here then the from the object your eyes are moving up so the from the this object the light will fall away from the fovea right so to see the things in highest equity visual equity you have to look straight so the light will be focused exactly on the fovea centralis not around the fovea centralis not, not outside of the fovea centralis like if you want to read something you know very small writings or letters uh, and want to see the colors very clearly you have to look straight make sense now uh, your rods are in the outer part of the retina so these are the rods and rods are responsible for scotopic vision or dark vision okay so in dim light or dark condition the rods are activated so the rods are activated in dim light or in darkness to see the things in you know shades the the gray shades you need the rods okay and uh, rods are not good to clearly uh, see the 
edges or color so rods are not useful to see the edges clearly or see the colors so that's why in dark or dim light condition uh, you don't see the color or the edges of the object clearly Makes sense? so that's the rods uh, as the rods help uh, you to see in darkness uh, this trick is used by uh, the you know star gazers most people um, in ancient time people used to use the trick to see the stars at night uh, sky uh, in the night sky uh, by looking slightly off not looking straight to the star uh, looking slightly off so you know if you look straight then the object will fall on the phobia but if you look slightly off as i mentioned it will fall on the outer part so uh, since at night the outer part works better because outer part has the rods the you know stargazers they used to um, look at the stars uh, not straight but slightly off that trick uh, uh, was being used by the sailors and the stargazers at night even they did not know how that works now we know how and why that works okay okay so um, if I see this a chunk of retina just let's see so uh, you have the rods why they are called the rods because the shape of the rods rod shape you see and this is the outer segment outer segment and this part is the inner segment where you have the nucleus here okay and the synapse axon okay uh, so the rods are like this okay. and then also you have the cones so let me draw the cone cone shaped outer segment and of course the nucleus okay and the snaps here so uh, this is the outer segment of cone nucleus okay so this is the photoreceptor layer in the retina photoreceptor layer where you have the rods and cones two types of photoreceptors and uh, you already know the outer part has the pigmented layer so these are the cells filled with the pigments melanin and the pigments absorb the light prevent scattering so pigmented layers functions i have already mentioned right so this is the pigmented layer of the retina okay actually the outer segment uh, uh, of the photoreceptor cells are kind of attached to the pigmented layer or inserted a little bit into the pigmented layer okay and then you have another layer here another layer of cells and this is called the bipolar cell layer this is bipolar because it has one dendrite this is the dendrite and this is the axon that side is bipolar right 
neurons, nucleus here. So this is the synapse, you see. The synapse or the neurotransmitter glutamate is released. So let me draw another bipolar. So this is another bipolar cell. This is another bipolar cell. Make sense? So these are bipolar cells. So we can say this layer of the retina is bipolar cell layer. And the last, the innermost layer is the ganglion cell layer. So let me draw with a different color. Ganglion cell. Okay. So see uh, nuclei. Okay. So this is the innermost ganglion cell layer. So those are three main, um, uh, four main layers, the pigmented layer, the outermost, then photoreceptor layer, bipolar cell layer, ganglion cell layer. Uh, in some places, you'll see that uh, they have divided the layers into further subdivisions, like, you know, plexiform layer, because the synapses are here, right? So where the axons and dendrites form plexuses or connections that's why they say plexiform this is outer plexiform this is inner plexiform makes sense right and this layer is nuclear layer because all nuclei are here okay so this is inner nuclear this is outer nuclear this is outer plexiform this is inner plexiform here okay now the light enters this way. Right, right. Light comes from inside. The eyeball passes through the vitreous humor. And I mentioned before that light passes through the retina. And then hits the photoreceptors. Okay, so the activation process starts from outside to inside, okay, not from inside to outside. So, uh, in the outer segment, you remember the outer segment of the photoreceptors, both in rods and cones, you have this disc like sacs, hundreds in in the outer segment, okay? And the structures, the chemical structures, rhodopsins are located in the discs, these outer segment discs, you have the chemical called the rhodopsins. And in the outer segment of the cones, you have the conopsins or also called photopsins. Same thing. Okay. There are different, three different types of photopsins. Um, the red, green, and blue, right? That's why you have three types of, three types of color sensitive cones because of three different types of opsins in the cones. Okay, now um, 
will see how the transduction occurs. Okay, which is very important. Signal transduction, you know, the conversion of electromagnetic energy to that mechanical energy to the electrical signal to take it to the brain type right? that's the transaction so what happens let me find a place to draw okay so uh, remember transduction occurs in rods and cones in same way so not different same way so if you know one then you know the other so let me draw here this is the outer segment of the rod right and this is the nuclear part the cell body and the synapse here end part okay you have the vesicles here filled with glutamate you remember i mentioned here glutamate is released here okay so uh, what happens for the signal transduction inside the outer segment here you have the discs right as i mentioned um, hundreds of discs so let me draw a few of them okay very good now in the wall of these discs you have the rod of sin so rod of sin And the rhodopsin has two structures. Each rhodopsin has two structures in it. Okay, so I can just use two different colors. So two, sorry, didn't work. Okay, so two different, right? So this is one part of rhodopsin and this is another part of rhodopsin okay so one part is called the opsin and another part is called the retinal okay So the opsin and the retinal. Okay, this part is the protein molecule and retinal is a chemical. Now if you see the structure of the retinal, you have Inside the retinal, you have a structure that is called 11 cis retinal. Okay, so like this 1, 2, 3, 4, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, 7. So here, in this chemical structure uh, there is a methyl group here methyl structure like this okay and then uh, at position 7 and this this is carbon ring right 
carbon ring and just know that this structure is called 11 cis retinal okay 11 cis retinal and when the light enters so let me draw the light so light hits the rod opsin. so what happens the 11 cis retinal changes its configuration shape okay and it is converted to all trans retinal what happens uh, this structure changes its position okay so now it will look like this so instead of this it will move the position shape or position and this is now called trans retinal all trans retinal from cis to trans okay and that will release this opsin okay from the rod opsin so the opsin will be freed okay will be released and that opsin will do what you see uh, will activate a protein here this is the protein it is everywhere this protein is called cyclic uh, uh, this protein is called transducing trans Reducing. okay so this transducing will be activated okay and when the transducing is activated it will activate a an enzyme that is called phosphodiesterase pd E phosphodiesterase. So let me draw with a different color that would be helpful. Orange, probably you like it. So this is the phosphodiesterase. Okay. Also known as cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase it will be activated okay and when the phosphodiesterase is activated what it does this activated enzyme will change the cyclic gmp inside the cell to gmp Make sense. So the cyclic GMP is the component that keeps the ion channels open. So if I draw the ion channels here, the ion channels are normally kept open by the cyclic gmp makes sense so cyclic gmp gets attached to the ion channels and keep them open in dark condition okay so in dark condition the channels are 
spoken because cyclic GMP is available okay uh, to keep the channels open that is in normal condition okay in dark condition when no light is presented so what happens the sodium influx occurs in dark light in dark or dim light condition the sodium will get in through these open channels make sense so what will happen depolarization positivity inside right that causes depolarization we talked about that before so when depolarization occurs what happens the electrical signal right will open the calcium channels here and calcium will enter and will rupture the vesicles you already know this so the vesicles will rupture and release the glutamate here make sense so the glutamate i showed you here in this area the glutamate is released at the synapses glutamate okay now um, that is in normal condition however since the light you see here i showed you the light uh, does all those changes let me repeat again light will stimulate the rhodopsin right and will change the retinal from 11 cis retinal to all trans retinal and that will free the opsin right and opsin will activate the transducing and the this protein transducing will then activate the phosphodiesterase cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase this enzyme and this enzyme will convert the cyclic GMP which keeps the ion channels open to GMP and GMP cannot keep the ion channels open so ion channels will get closed now when the light is presented to the rods right makes sense so now the channels are closed because cyclic gmp has been converted to gmp okay which is not uh, you know capable to keep the channels open so sodium will not get in so what will happen now now hyperpolarization will occur okay so instead of depolarization which is like this remember this depolarization is not action potential when the ion channels are open sodium ions are getting in uh, in presence of cyclic gmp the depolarization that occurs that is the graded potential okay we talked about the graded potential and action potential so this is not action potential this is graded potential okay that means uh, epsp excitatory post synaptic excitatory post synaptic potential epsp it does not reach to the threshold to produce the action potential okay however when the channels are blocked so no more depolarization instead you will see hyperpolarization that means below the resting so this is IPSP or inhibitory postsynaptic potential which is called hyperpolarization. Makes sense, right? Opposite. So when hyperpolarization will occur, then less glutamate will be released here. Almost no glutamate will be released here. No rupture of the vesicles, right? So the amount of glutamate here will be less when the light activates the photoreceptors okay so no glutamate 
is released. Okay. Now something is very interesting here. Okay, you have to remember when more glutamate is released here in absence of light. Okay, then what happens? The bipolar cells are inactive in presence of more glutamate. So this is something opposite of normal. Okay, and when no glutamate or less glutamate is released in this synapse, that would activate the bipolar cells okay so <clears throat> the bipolar cells will be activated make sense so depolarization will occur in the bipolar cells and here also glutamate will be released so when the bipolar cells are activated more in no glutamate condition in this synapse then more glutamate will be released here because bipolar cells are now activated more make sense so now this is like normal more glutamate will activate more ganglion cells here so in the ganglion cells also excitatory post synaptic uh, well, uh, in the ganglion cells, the action potential will be generated here. And that will be taken out by these axons of the ganglion cells. Now you see the axons of these ganglion cells bundled together to form the optic norm okay so you see here in ganglion cells post synaptic excitatory post synaptic potential will be generated uh, so depolarization of the ganglion cell will cause the signal out through the axons of the ganglion cells and these axons axon fibers together form the optic nerve so optic nerve which is the cranial nerve number two optic nerve takes the visual signal out from the retina okay now let's go back here so you know that you have the optic disc so fovea central is here right <clears throat> this is the optic disc and from all these cells the axons join together and get out so axons will join together right form the bundle and will get out through the optic disc or blind spot so this is the optic nerve or cranial nerve number two so that's how the signal is taken out from the retina okay towards the brain okay and that's how the transduction of the signal visual signal takes place make sense now uh, let's talk a little bit more about the retinal cells so photoreceptor cells bipolar cells ganglion cells you know those are three main types of cells also we have two other types of cells let me draw here this cell is called the horizontal cell why you see the way it is connecting the photoreceptor cells um, one to another horizontally right like this sideway so these are called the horizontal cells these tiny cells here and the horizontal cells release the chemical that is called GABA and 
by releasing GABA, the horizontal cells modulate the signal. Okay, so you know when you switch from one condition to another bright light to less bright light or to dim light or dim light to bright light, there's a lot of modulation uh, takes place, right? So this horizontal cell regulates the signal uh, uh, transmission or activation of the cells. So that is one type of cell and also there is another type of cells these cells are like kind of vertical and these cells connect the bipolar and ganglia like this so bipolar to ganglion and these cells are called the amacrine cells amacrine cells they also release GABA and dopamine to to regulate the or modulate the signal transmission uh, between the retinal bipolar and ganglion cells so those are different types of cells in the retina okay so different layers and different cells and also i explained how the transduction of signal takes place okay so <clears throat> that is uh, important now here you see the extrinsic eye muscles or extraocular muscles right i mentioned that inside the orbital fossa which is formed by the bones right and there is a tendinous ring so this is the tendinous ring tendon and from that ring the extrinsic eye muscles arise and get attached to the eyeball outer surface of the eyeball so this is the eyeball okay so this is bone bony you know uh, orbit orbital fossa this is the tendinous ring and these are the muscles from different directions and this is the eyeball okay and there are six extrinsic eye muscles um, they move the eyeball in different directions so what are those six extrinsic eye muscles four of them are straight that's why they are called rectus okay superior inferior lateral medial so easy superior inferior lateral and medial rectus okay and also there are two oblique muscles superior oblique and the inferior oblique okay so those are the six extraocular or extrinsic eye muscles two oblique muscles superior and inferior okay so here you see this is superior rectus this is inferior rectus this is lateral side so lateral rectus and this is medial rectus right so you see four rectus and this one is superior oblique you see what happens here the superior oblique is going like this and the tendon is getting attached like this way lateral medially right not this way so this one will be more helpful to rotate the eye similarly inferior oblique you see going like this so superior oblique inferior oblique but rectus straight okay and 
the extrinsic or extraocular muscles are controlled by the cranial nerves. Three cranial nerves control these extraocular muscles. The most powerful one is the oculomotor. Its name is telling you oculo, eye motor movement. Oculomotor. Okay. Then abducens. Abducens is another one. Abducens. Okay. And trochlear. Nerve. Okay. Oculomotor is cranial nerve number three. Olfactory optic oculomotor number three. Okay. And abducens is cranial nerve number seven. Uh, uh, cranial nerve number six. And trochlear is cranial nerve number four. So oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens. Okay and which muscles are controlled by the oculomotor nerve four out of six which four medial rectus superior rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique so three rectus medial and then superior inferior and inferior oblique so three rectus one oblique is controlled by the oculomotor nerve only the lateral rectus is controlled by abducens. Lateral rectus, if you remember this one, lateral rectus by abducens, and the superior oblique by trochlear. Other four are controlled by the oculomotor nerve. Okay, and the lateral rectus. Uh, moves the eye laterally that makes sense you see this muscle if it contracts then it the, it will move the eyeball laterally remember uh, uh, the eyeball will move towards the muscle when the muscle contracts so this muscle is laterally so it will move the eyeball laterally this one is medially so it will move the eyeball medially Make sense? So lateral will move laterally, medial rectus will move medially, okay, towards the nose and laterally towards the side, okay. Superior rectus, this one, remember, elevates the eye, of course, this is superior rectus, right? So it will move superiorly, that means upwards, when you look something up, you move the eyeball superiorly, upwards. However, also, it turns the eye, eyeball, medially. So, superior as well as medial. Okay. And inferior rectus. Uh, so, uh, the inferior rectus moves the eyeball down. That means it depresses the eye and turns it medially. So, both superior and inferior rectus turn towards them as well as medially. Okay, so superior upwards and medially, inferior downwards and medially. Okay, and the obliques, two obliques turn the eye laterally. Since the superior and inferior rectus are moving medially too, then someone has to move laterally, right? So those two obliques, obliques move the eyeball laterally. Okay, so uh, that's how the Extrinsic eye muscles or extraocular muscles are controlled by different cranial nerves and the ways they move the eye. Okay, and we already know that eyeball movement could be voluntary or involuntary, like reflex or you know um, voluntary movement, autonomous or voluntary. Okay.
So here you can see those information I gave you about the extrinsic eye muscles. Okay. Pupil. You know that uh, the aperture or opening inside the pupil is the iris is the pupil. We talked about that. And if you see the iris, the iris has two types of muscle fibers. This is the pupil, the opening, and around the pupil you have the circular muscle fibers. Those are the sphincter pupilli, and then the outer part you have radial fibers. So these are radial. So inner circular and inner circular causes constriction of the pupil because these muscle fibers are round, right? So when they get short, that will make the pupil smaller. Okay. And when the outer radial fibers contract, inner sphincter muscle relaxes, then they will pull the circular or sphincter muscle outwards from all directions. So the pupil will dilate, okay, due to relaxation of this and contraction of this. So that's how the uh, dilatation and constriction of the pupil take place. And I mentioned the conditions, uh, how sympathetic, parasympathetic, um, uh, activation changes the shape of the pupil or size of the pupil and um, also uh, I mentioned that the light amount of light uh, changes the pupil okay so if you see here uh, now uh, uh, everything I explained already okay uh, the last thing in this part uh, is the function of the lens that I explained already. However, what happens if the lens uh, cannot focus the light exactly on the retina? Lens supposed to focus the light exactly on the retina, right? To see the things clearly. Now, if for some reason the lens fails it could be due to age, the flexibility of the lens can be, you know, reduced or uh, changed. And then the lens may not be able to focus the light exactly on the retina. It could be before or after. So, of course, light cannot get out just hypothetically if the light is focused here or here, but not on the retina that causes the refractory disorder or problem. So if the light is focused in front before retina, that causes the refraction disorder that is called the myopia. also known as short-sightedness. That means the person can see the near things clearly, but has problem uh, uh, to see the far things clearly. Now, if it is here, then that is called the hyperopia. Far-sightedness. The person can see the far things clearly, but problem is to see the near things clearly okay so in both cases you have to do what you have to use the glasses in this case you have to push it back on the retina and in this case you have to move it forward to put exactly on the retina that's why you use the glasses two different types of glasses you remember i mentioned that the more round or thick lens will do what will if the lens is more round hold on 
here. Yeah. Okay, so if the lens is more round, then it will bend the light more. Make sense? If it is flat, thin, it will bend less, less powerful. <coughs> Make sense? So in this case, in hyperopia, you have to bend more to bring here, right? So you will use the biconvex round lens. In this case, in myopia, you have to use more <coughs> flat. That is actually concave lens that will do what instead of conversing we don't need to converse more we have to diverse right so spread more so in that case we have to use concave lens so it will do like this okay then it will go through the actual lens of the eye so first through the glass of the eye uh, eye glasses you have the concave lens so it will cause divergence and then through the lens it will uh, the convergence okay so that's why we use the concave lens to fix the myopia and by convex to fix the hyperopia okay makes sense uh, sometimes when you know uh, the kids suddenly grow the orbital fossa uh, in the skull doesn't get big enough uh, to accommodate the growth of the eye the eye soft tissue organ grows faster than the bone so what happens like if you have the bones around which is not you know getting bigger but the eyeball is getting bigger or faster uh, getting bigger then pressure will fall on the eyeball right so in that case since the bone is around the eyeball will get more elongated like this in young kids now you see your lens doesn't know your lens thinks that retina is still here so it will focus here but actually the eyeball has been elongated so the retina has been pushed backwards right so in this case the myopia happens the focus is uh, in front of or before the retina because retina has pushed backwards okay so that's why the kids need to use the glasses concave glasses to fix the myopia okay uh, the term astigmatism if the lens the surface of the lens gets irregular or even the cornea which is the fixed lens of the eye okay the surface gets irregular the focus will be defective and this is called astigmatism astigmatism okay <coughs> irregular surface of the cornea or the lens if the lens lens is highly transparent right no blood vessels uh, very transparent fibers connective tissue fibers form the lens and those fibers are highly transparent okay no nerve no blood vessels so the lens allows the light pass through it without any obstacle however uh, sometimes that protein highly transparent protein uh, of the fibers uh, may lose the transparency so the lens will get cloudy and that condition is called cataract cataract all of you have heard this condition um, usually occurs due to age older people get more right cataract <coughs> diabetes mellitus 
also radiation uv radiation all those could be the factors responsible for this condition clinical condition you have to uh, remove the lens surgical removal of the lens is not so difficult because no blood vessels or nerves are uh, innervating the lens so it is rather simple surgery okay uh, less bleeding almost no bleeding okay so let's uh, stop here uh, and we'll talk more about the visual system in next lecture